had a really impactful um, speech which which kind of like went viral worldwide mm-hmm. and um, what it done is what it highlighted to a lot of people which I think people should have known about anyway which was sort of like some of the historic lessons of um, the economic impact of slavery on the black community which is still having a, a serious effect now and then right. um, you gave this beautiful analogy using the monopoly board which I'm sure you've been asked about several times in regards to how economics works and how fair economic works and what happens when the system is not fair and is rigged in a sense and I just thought like the speech was very emotional it was straight from the heart it was very deep and it's something that's impacting people worldwide and it's making people think about how they see um the black experience and how they see black people who are who are more times seen as just complaining about opportunities and and not having access so first of all, do you mind me just asking, how did that speech come about? And um, what was you actually up to that day when that speech came about? So I had been protesting for several days when that speech happened. Mm. So I think having been on the front line, I had been on the front line for like a week at that point, a week straight. Yeah. Um, I was definitely like just like exhausted. But more than anything that day, I was exhausted with the narrative where everyone was trying to redirect the narrative um, to the riots and the looting. And I was just like, that's, that's not why we're out here. Like, that's not the point of this conversation. But if you want to get into why, you know, this is happening, we can deal in the why. Um, And I think some people have tried to like, you know, like twist the words to be like, oh, she's telling people to riot and loot. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you have to understand why people are doing that. And then once you understand why people are doing that, then we can start to make the necessary changes um, to give, you know, equality to everybody, that there's fair equity going around. But that day was just like a day when I was just like tired. And the narrative that had been going on consistently was not something that I was interested in. Um, And the guy who was doing the documentary was out there and he asked me a question. And that just, I feel like the ancestors, you know, Spoke for you. Yeah. Yeah. Fell out. Yeah, it, it was a very spirit-filled speech. I mean, you, you, you could see that it wasn't scripted, it wasn't planned. It, it's something that came from deep within. As you said, it was the ancestors. And going back to what you said about how people kind of misconstrued what you said, a lot of people took the line, um, they, they can burn this shit down, as you say, in, inciting violence and, and hate. And I, I, I mean, I'm a logical thinker. I knew that's not what you meant. I knew yeah. you was asking the questions as to that, that people should be looking at the why people are doing this and not the, yeah. the, the cause or the, the effects of what they've done. So what is the why for those who wanted to know exactly what you was trying to reason? Yeah, the why is because people are, people are hopeless. People are ve- feeling very hopeless and they felt hopeless for a long time. And there have been generations of people being feeling hopeless and passing that hopelessness down. And, and, you know, in a country as rich as America, the fact that we have communities that are food deserts where someone has to drive, you know, five miles to get to the nearest grocer, like that's ridiculous. That shouldn't be. We have kids here who the only time they they eat is during school that, you know, after school and on weekends, they don't have access to food. And it's like in a nation that has so much overflow for us to still have food insecurity is ridiculous. And we've all, you know, globally, right, have have committed to this this kind of like capitalist blings out expectation of what makes someone have value. And so we consistently like dangle that carrot in front of people and say, for you to be deemed interesting, for you to have value, for you to be someone I, I feel the need to respect, I need to see you attached to this, this capitalism and this opulence. And so when we continue to do that to people and they are poor and they are food insecure and they are disparaged and hopeless, if something like this happens where there's broken glass, they're not going to hesitate to walk through the glass because in their mind, there's there's no hope coming on the other side yeah. that they will be able to participate in this, you know, in, the, in this uh, kind of like, you know, superficial world that we built around people. And we do make people feel bad for being poor. Like yeah. we make people feel bad for being yeah. poor and for not having things. And and that's even like teaching people poor finances because 
whether or not you have money is not based on the things that you wear and own. That just tells me how much money you spent, not much how much money you have. Most definitely. I think <laughs> with with a lot of us um, that live outside America, whenever we think about America, we always think about the American dream. And the American yeah. dream always seems to be this big, lavish, flashy thing which everyone kind of aspires for. So if you're if you're at the bottom of this hierarchical chain and you're looking at this thing being sold as the dream of your nation, it's going to be extremely hard for you to uh, rise from where you are to reach that sort of pinnacle. What, what do you think the changing narrative should be then in terms of like as a nation? I think that definitely that the change in narrative should be that we should be focused on getting educated, mm -hmm. um, be focused on community service, um, and we should be making sure that the liberty um, that the ancestors talked about is actually fair and given to everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are laws in place here that were put in place right after slavery in order to keep slaves and slaves in check. And those laws are still on the book. Those laws have never changed. So when you're training police officers and educating them on how to manage people, you're training them based on laws um, like the Black Codes and the 13th Amendment yeah. that were actually put in place to keep slaves in check after slavery ended. Um, and so it's no wonder that what we have here in the terms of police officers who police our neighborhoods is that they function like slave catchers instead of guardians of the community who's trying to make sure the community is safe. And so I think we have to retrain our officers. I know people, there's this movement going here called defund the police. I yeah. Think yeah, I think it's poor verbiage. Yeah. And I think that's why it's a non-starter for people because people imagine a world with no police and someone can come through their window and yeah. there'll be no Discussions. They should actually d discuss the fact that what it really is is a reallocation of front funds and reformation in yeah. order to have a better system in the way in which we police our our communities. I mean, at the end of the day, like you just cannot deny the numbers. Thousands of African Americans have died at the hands of gunfire from police for menial crimes over the past five years alone. Yeah, like I, you be honest about. It. That's crazy. I mean, we don't we don't even get that many homicides in this country. <laughs> I mean, right. it, it, if we was to get that, the country would probably go in a lockdown because we're, we're completely different to America in terms of like violence, because you're not even yeah. allowed to have guns here, even though we do have some level of gun crime. Um, it's mainly knife crime around here. And th what that's do we the need a gun for? Who needs a gun? What do you need a gun for? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's the issue now because with with the with the American gun laws, it's been upheld for such a long period of time now. It's like how do they completely rewind that? And I think that's where the battle is, and it's become political as well. It's either a right or a left thing, which then makes it a bit of an issue because there's no middle ground to have a civil conversation about it to discuss where it goes next. Yeah, which is the scary part. I mean, um, it, I'm glad you brought up the issue with um, the defunding the police because everyone is starting to scream it over here as well in the UK. And I definitely think the way forward would be a, a training and a whole revamp of the system as a whole, not defund it. Because if it was to just defund it tomorrow, I think the people that will suffer the most would be most likely the black community, most likely right. the people at the bottom of this hierarchy that, that we know exist within society. Um, right. I think policing should definitely be community owned and it should be, they should have a complete overhaul initially in terms of like cut, cut all the bad apples out. Those who've had like enough reports about them, those who've had enough complaints about them, have an independent audit like with the community and we look through these individual reports and completely get rid of the bad apples. Because if you had police officers that have shot five people, whatever it is some of them have done in the States, why are they continuously shooting people? Why are they continuously trigger happy? Why are they continuously getting reports and complaints of abuse? So these things need to be looked into. And then I think maybe instead of defunding, maybe they need to turn the role into a more prestigious role whereby people actually, whereby they're hiring the right sorts of individuals. Because at the moment, I, I heard that it's easier to become a, what well, training for police officers is easier than becoming a barber in the States in some parts. Yeah, yeah. We, we, which is which is ridiculous and scary. It's absolutely ridiculous. But uh, how do we, how do we go about for change? So when when we talk about change as a whole, where do we start? Where is the change? I think I think we start with that. I think we start with the reformation in the police department. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and I'm a person, you know, I'm an artist, so I'm pro union because unions have helped me, you know, as a filmmaker. Yeah. But think that we need, also need to examine what's going on in the police union because that's where they've been able to hide when they have this misconduct. That's where why people who have a record of two to three separate infractions are able to still keep their job. There's a mom here. I've been working with her for about two years on her son's case. Her son was murdered four years ago, uh, Jamarian Robinson. They fired over 90 rounds at him. 76 rounds hit his body. You know, how do you not know that that's excessive force? Yeah. Well, the officers who did that 
Like one of the officers who did that um, was, you know, not arrested, not fired from his job. And fast forward now, the incident that we had here where the officers pulled the college kids out of their car and tased them, he was one of them. So this is, this, you know, there's a track record for these people. And so I agree with you. I think that's a brilliant idea. I'm going to have to to pass that on to my next meeting that I'm in. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, I think we should be looking at the records of some of these officers. We should get rid of the bad apples. We should do fresh new training, more extensive training for the officers are there. And also we need to take some of the stuff off of these officers' plates. Officers should not be responding to someone who's having a mental health crisis. Mm. Officers should not be responding to to neighboring businesses that are having like a city line, you know, issue. Um, the amount of stuff that you can call 911 for, it's too extensive. They're, they are being asked to do too many different things over the course of the day. And so, you know, part of how you can reallocate those funds is like, you you don't need officers to answer all of these calls. Like some of these calls, it's like, there's gotta be other people that, you know, 911 should be able to dispatch you to, to handle these situations. Yeah. Um, so I think that's step one, because that's the biggest issue right now. But then after that, then we really have to, the secondary thing is we have to look at like an ep economic structure of like how we are going to help the proletariat, the impoverished people of this nation. Um, because a lot of what we're, a lot of what you're seeing is, you know, the, the, the proletariat speaking up for themselves and taking to the streets. And because that's where a lot of this abuse of power happens is in those communities. But also, this is why you see high levels of crime in that community, right? Because when yeah. people are starving and don't have money, they steal things. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, I think the looting, the looting was a classic example of that. Because if you don't yeah. have anything, this is the fantastic opportunity to to go and loot. Because as, as you mentioned in your speech as well, that there's three groups of people that tend to attend um, um, um um, not riots as such, but um, <laughs> protests. Yes, yeah, tend to attend protests. You, you have the protesters who are genuinely there, you have yeah. the rioters and then the looters who are taking the opportunity to gain what they can't potentially get in a normal day life, whether that's justified or not. Um, yeah. I mean, you mentioned earlier on about the police being called out for things that might not necessarily need brute force. I was watching the um, Rashad Brooks video. Um, I've only managed to gather myself to watch it recently because there's been too much happening on social media. And to right. protect my own mental sanity, I, I kind of I, 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 I take periods. Yeah, I take a break because it yeah. becomes too much. It becomes overloading. And, and mentally as well, you need to make sure that you're safe and you're in a good place. So I watched it recently and I realized that like. For, for some situations, just having that bit of, not, not even just humanity, just having that bit of common sense is to say, okay, this person is drunk. He's, he's yeah. parked his car. Send him in an Uber home. That would, have been the end of the, that would have been the end of the case. So it's about having these processes in place or maybe these different units that deal with different situations where guns might not necessarily have to be involved in. Because when you're, when you're going up to someone with a gun, or as they say here in the UK, if you carry a knife, you're bound to use it or have it used against you. And yeah. that's what tends to happen in these situations, whereby it's, it's, it's over-policing and it's, yeah. it's, it's done wrongly. And sometimes they need to be maybe community sectors that deal with these issues. But um, worldwide now, there seems to be some sort of global awakening. Like there seems to be something is happening. I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying to put my finger on exactly what is that's happening. But a lot is happening. I don't know if you've been keeping an eye on what's happening on this side of the... the, the... I, I have a few friends in Parliament, so I've been oh, talking okay. Keeping up with them. Yeah, the, the movement has been extremely heavy here as well yeah. um, in terms of like support for um, the, um, the movement over in the States and also for issues that we've had over here. W what do you think this movement is the, in terms of the awakening? I'm not just talking about Black Lives Matter as a whole, but I'm talking about the whole world seeing what's happening and people are waking up. Where, where do, what do you think it is and where do you think it's heading to? Um, I think I think it's twofold, right? So I think that part of it is it's not surprising to me that this is coming on the back of a global pandemic. Mm. So the world was sitting at home and, and really paying attention yeah. for the first time. And these were not issues that you could just gloss back gloss over and then, you know, for here, take your kids to socket or soccer or take your kids to cricket. Um and and just like forget that like, you know, like life is happening. Um people were still and they had to pay attention. And so I think that that played a huge part in why people are now, you know, um paying attention to things. The other the other thing is right, the diaspora as a whole, um, you know, people who are of Afri African descent as a whole globally, that people just really like to mess with us. Like, <laughs> yeah. People really like to mess with us. And it, it's funny because 
you know, I, I've, I've been to places and had conversations with friends who are Haitian, friends who are, you know, from South Africa, p- friends who are from London. And I'm having these very, you know, familiar conversations about implicit bias that they experience on a day to day nation. Or, you know, I've talked to several, you know, elders who live through apartheid and, you know, they're talking about how there has not been the proper, you know, reparations even there put in place since apartheid was abolished. And so I think globally, um, and I I won't even just say black people, but globally marginalized people have had such disparagement to face that even people who don't connect um, in that way to Black Lives Matter are just connecting to this idea of marginalization. And so it's hitting them in a very different way because that may not that may not be their story exactly, but they're like, but I get it. I've I've felt that feeling. I've been in rooms where I've known that you know my my ethnicity is the reason why I was being treated a certain way. So, but I mean, I I see people in New Zealand, and I get messages from people in Israel, and you know, messages from like Belgium and all these places. But I think there was a worldwide awakening because of the pandemic, because for the yeah. first time, people had to swallow some truth. Yeah. And I think people had time to like process and really digest stuff because we had nothing else like distracting us. Um, I think when, when you look globally, when I look globally, in particular, in terms of like how um, um, the, the downtrodden and particularly the, the black people have suffered globally, I think the, the historic the, the historic uh, experience of black people plays a major part. We were always like in all of our history, especially in the West, has always been there were slaves and then there were slaves and then. So I think that kind of sifts through globally. So everyone has that at the back of their mind that at one point these people were slaves. And whether that has an effect on uh, on them direct, or effect on people directly is in how they interact with black people, it does have an underlining tone to it. It does have an underlining issue whereby you know at some point your ancestors were beneath mine. So it it makes them feel sort of like empowered in a bit, which is not the way that things should be done but to me i'm i'm a solution based guy so i'm always trying to think how does how does a narrative get changed does it need chaos in order for there to be order or is there something that can be done on a micro level by us or by people within society well i think i think because it had got, gotten so out of hand and gone so far and people had chosen not to listen for so long i think we had to have this disruption i think this disruption was necessary in order to wake people up now does it did it did it should it have had to have that have that no it shouldn't mm. have should have been able to connect with people on a human level and understand and believe people when they were telling them i'm i'm yeah. suffering I'm hurting. Um, But that didn't happen. And so we needed this awakening. We needed this disruption um, for people to recognize, you know, kind of like what needed to happen. Now, Mm. now that we've done that, that's the big question is, what are we going to do next? What's What's the next thing that needs to be done? And I think that, you know, one, I think a, you know, reformation of the police department for, I can speak for here in the states reformation of the police department is step one but i think that access to um resources is going to be second because we've been denied access to resources for so very long and then third i think we need to look at a lot of the laws on the book and they need to go because the reason that george zimmerman was able to get away with killing trayvon martin the reason those two vigilantes were able to kill ahmaud aubrey and sit at home for all that time is because we have these ridiculous laws like the stand your ground law Mm. if people say the rules of that law out loud i don't understand how they don't hear that and find themselves feeling silly The law is literally, if you and I are in the same space and I tell you that I have a gun and to back off and you don't, then I can shoot you. That is like the dumbest thing. That is not something that you need. We I mean, have laws around self-defense. We should not have a law that says, I'm warning you, I'm going to shoot you. So and if shoot, you don't yeah. run away, I can and get away with it. That sounds crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, say, I mean, when I have talks with my friends, for instance, and we, we look at the states and your laws, we just think, how the hell do people live with these type of laws? It's mad. It's scary for us because yeah. I, I know if, if, if you implement those laws everywhere globally, you're going to get the same results. You're going to find people killing each other unlawfully. It's, it's just that yeah. the law is silly within itself and the ownership of guns is, is silly because people talk about self-preservation, but if, if no one had guns, 
there wouldn't be that and many killings in the first place. It's like looking at looking at the stats in the UK. There's a reason why we don't have that many gun um, gun crime or um, gun killings or shootings. Yeah. yeah, because there's no guns and those who have guns are quite rare. So to find out that someone gets shot by a gun. So it's just quite simple. It's just cause and effect. If you have a law that enables people to have guns, they're bound to use it more and they're yeah. bound to cause um, more issues. Um, I was I was having a conversation with, with a friend of mine who mentioned um, something quite interesting. I wanted to know your thoughts on it. So he said um, in, in, in situations like this, it's, it's either you look for um, what did he say? He said, um, what was it? He said, segregation, fight or talk. He, he gave me those three things. And um, he said, it seems like we've been through all three stages now, well, in particularly in relations to America. It, it seems like you guys have been through segregation, um, the civil rights movement, there was a lot of talking. And I think fighting has also been a continuous theme within. So yeah. what, 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 what is it? What's, what's, what's next in, in what's, a sense? I think what's next is, organ is I think is is legislation. We need to get some laws changed. We need to get some laws taken off the book. And then just organization, like figuring out a structural way in which we could start mending some of the gaps and the wounds. That mm. is that is the most important thing. Um, I actually had a really, um, I was on an amazing panel um, last night with some awesome women, but mm. one in particular that stuck out to me was I, on that panel was Dr. Bernice King, Martin Luther King's daughter. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, she's brilliant, just like her father. Mm. And, you know, that was one of the things that she was talking about is like how we have to give structure now to what the, we have to give, we have to give voice to what it is that the movement wants. And then we have to put proper structure behind it so that things could get done because that's how MLK was able to get things done is that he had a plan. He knew what yeah. he wanted had a plan he knew what to ask for and he knew how to go get it and so that's the phase that we're at now and there are a lot of leaders here who are trying to like have those meetings and have those conversations so we can get those things together um but that that is imperative now is that it has to we have to pass laws and get rid of old laws that yeah. uh, allow these moments in these situations to happen. Most definitely. Um, I think you mentioned something there which was quite critical in terms of like leadership. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all the previous, there was leadership and it, yeah. there was a hierarchy of leadership. So there was understanding. So they were able to all sit down together, construct stuff that, that, the, that the people would then agree to and then they can take forward. Um, yeah. So recently here in the UK, there was a lot of questioning because I think there was like a million pound raised recently for um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And mm -hmm. um, what one of the um, primary individuals who've been really, really piloting for the movement and been out there front line, um, he, he's a big musician here as well. He, he put forward a question was like, I've been fighting. He's been out there in all the protests and we had right wing versus left versus a protest of wars happening in the city of London. And he was there. He was front line. And he said one of the issues that he's finding at the moment is that he does, he's, even though he's fighting for the cause, he doesn't know where the leadership is. There seems to be a leadership vacuum. And yeah. um, he doesn't know where the money is going. And if the money is going um, into the causes which would have tangible effects on the community. And right. do, do, you, do you feel that sense of leadership vacuum? Or is there something happening over there in the States? Um, I think that that was definitely the case initially. Um, I think some some people who are voices we should be listening to have definitely stepped up. Um, one for sure is Tamika Mallory. That sister is always like to me. I'm like when every when everything else is going on and people are and I can't pay attention. I'm like I'm gonna go to Tamika's page so I can get the proper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or I'm gonna I'm gonna see where Tamika is telling us to send our money. I'm gonna see what it is that that queen is telling us to do. Be and and the reason that I say that is because she is the one person who has been consistent. This is not new to her. She has been in this fight for about a decade. Her organization is tried and true, and what it is they've been able to comp accomplish in terms of prison reform, um, and things like that. And so. She definitely, for a lot of us in the States, is our MLK. Like, okay. she's our go-to person that we look to. But I don't think if that, I don't know if that has trickled out beyond the States. Um, but I know here, we definitely, that's our go-to person. I, I, know <laughs> I won't keep you too long. So I, I was just going to ask you just, just two more questions, because um, I know you're a busy, you're busy lady now, so I'll, I'll leave you to it. Um, so in the car so she also is not interested in me doing any interviews say hello gabrielle hi hello gabrielle how you doing <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so i was gonna ask you so in the midst of whilst changes 
taking place um, seemingly, and I hope that some real significant change happens. Um, what are the some what are the things that um, the community can do on a micro level to sort of like uplift themselves and better themselves? I think one of the things that the people can do on a micro level is to pay attention to what's going on and get involved in their local elections. Um, people always want to vote for federally and be involved federally, but what actually happens to you, what affects you on a day-to-day -day basis is what's happening at the local level. Because the, And the main thing is, hang on, Gabrielle, do you see me on the phone? Cut that out. Um, one of them, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> One of the main things is like a lot of what is being affected about whether or not these people are being charged is are the district attorneys and the judges. And so it's time that we start paying attention to those records. And if those people need to get out of those seats because they are giving harsher sentences to black and brown people, if they are giving police officers passes when they commit these atrocities, then we need to put ourselves together and find a viable candidate in the community and remove them from those benches. Yeah, most definitely. I think get, getting together as a people is, is is always the best way to fight any cause. Yeah. And, and if, if you've got power within a certain government setting or council setting, as we have here in the UK, then it's about making sure that you weed out those who are not fit for the job. And that's the end of the case. If you find someone not fit for the job, make sure you weed them out. Make sure it becomes a repetitive thing. Because what, what, what repetition does is it creates behaviours. Because if people know that they misbehave or they're not doing their job right, you're going to lose your job. You're, you're, you're going on the chopping block. So that's definitely something that... Um, the community should implement and enforce, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, just before I let you leave, can you tell me a bit about your book as well? Because I know you've got a wonderful book called um, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, right? So if you just yes. tell the people about your book. Yes, the book is called I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. I wrote it with one of my closest and dearest friends, Geely Siegel, who just happens to be white. And yeah. so the book <laughs> in, um, is told in a dual narrative. Um, there are two main characters, Campbell mm. and Lena, one is black and one is white. And so it's told in alternating chapters about how these two girls survived the night in a riot. Okay. And so they're not involved in the protest or anything. They just happen to get caught out there. Um, but it forces them to have some difficult conversations. They're not friends, so they don't have a pre-existing relationship. Um, they are just trying to survive the night together. And so in the alternating chapters, you get to see how differently they see the same night. But also, because they're both female, the places in which they connect. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's, it gives an amazing example of life in general and how different people have different experiences based on whatever it be, whether it be their gender or their race. It's just that it's just how we're wired as people. And if you're able to see someone else's experience, if it's worse than yours, you're able to then empathize more and truly understand. And it kind of enables you to to be better for them and you being better for each other as a whole. And I really appreciate that. And I'm going to encourage all my listeners and viewers to go and check out your book. And I'm going to push it. But Kimberly, I really appreciate your time today because I know you're extremely busy. I've seen you everywhere so far. I've seen you with Trevor Noah. I've seen you, Steve Harvey. And I mean, th this is a bit of a step down, but I appreciate your time. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no, this, you are exactly the type of pe person that I like to talk to. We have to talk to people who actually yeah. have hands on the community. That is super important. Really appreciate that. We're definitely going to catch up at some time, and I wish you all the luck with all the work that you're doing. And stay blessed and enjoy the rest of your day, right? You too. Have a great right. one. Next time right, I come on, we'll have to, like, go have a drink. Most definitely. When you're done, hit me up. We're definitely going to catch up. I'm chased, I'm chased, I'm chased, I'm chased. All right, you too. Take care. Stay blessed.